Chronicles, it is my custom to unfold my second newspaper. I have two delivered every morning. The first one is very gossipy, really. I've nicknamed it the Daily All Sorts, which is really what it is, since the regrettable change of proprietor. But in the afternoon, having finished luncheon and treated myself to a twenty minutes nap in a specially purchased chair which caters for the demands of my rheumatic back, I open the Times for a more leisurely perusal. Not that that newspaper is anything like it used to be. Now it is very hard to find where any of the news is, in between adverts for travel in Capri with illustrations, sport which has far more prominence now than it had in the old days. The court news and obituaries, which I like to look at first, can also appear anywhere, though lately they seem to have settled down on the back page. Running my eye down the births, marriages and deaths, I'm afraid really only the last one has any relevance to me now. It is very unlikely I will recognise any of the names in the births columns, unless it was grandchildren rather than children. And as for the marriages... Well, all my friends' children are married long ago. Sadly, nowadays, one is only really interested in the deaths. Let me see. Alloway, Angopastro, Arden, Barton, Bedshaw, Burgoviser. Dear me, what a German name, but he seems to be late of Leeds. Carpenter, Camperdown, Clegg, Clegg. Now... Was that one of the Cleggs I knew? No, this is a Janet Clegg. Somewhere in Yorkshire. MacDonald, Mackenzie, Nicholson. Nicholson. No, not one that I knew. Og, Ormorod. Ah, that must be one of the aunts. Yes, Linda Ormorod. I hadn't known her. Quantrill. Oh, dear me, that's Elizabeth Quantrill. Eighty-five. Well, really. I thought she died some years ago. Fancy her having lived so long. She was always so delicate. Nobody expected her to make old bones. Race, Radley, Raphael. Raphael. Now, that name is familiar. Raphael. Belford Park Maidstone. Belford Park Maidstone. No, I don't recall that address. No flowers. Jason Raphael. Oh, well, an unusual name. I must have just heard it somewhere. Ross Perkins. Oh, now, that might be... Oh, no, it isn't. Ryland, Emily Ryland. No, no, I've never known an Emily Ryland. Deeply loved by her husband and children. Well, that's very nice or very sad, whichever way you like to look at it. Ah, well, perhaps I shall just have a little look at the crossword, though we make the print so small these days. Raphael, Raphael. It will come to me, no doubt. I glanced out of the window towards the garden, but I cannot bear to look at it now. Once it gave me hours of pleasure, but the doctors have told me that it is too much for me. I did try to fight the ban, but I must admit I had to give up after an hour. Now, my knitting. I'm knitting a woolly child's jacket, and I've nearly finished. The back is done and the front, but, oh dear, now the sleeves, which are so tedious, and two of them, very boring. "'but I do like this colour of pink wool. "'Very pretty. "'I had... "'Oh, of course, yes, that was it. "'The blue sea, the Caribbean sea, "'a sandy beach, sunshine, knitting with pink wool. "'Mr. Raphael, of course, the trip I made to the Caribbean. "'It was a treat for my nephew Raymond. "'I remember Joan, Raymond's wife, saying, "'Don't you get mixed up in any murders, Aunt Jane. "'It isn't good for you.' "'and I hadn't intended to, but these things just happen. Oh, "'It was all because of that elderly major with a glass eye "'who insisted on telling me some long and boring stories. Oh, "'Poor major, what was his name? "'Ah, oh, well, 
There was Mr. Raphael and his secretary, Mrs. Mrs. Walters, yes, Esther Walters, and his masseur attendant, Jackson. Ah, yes, it's all coming back. So poor Mr. Raphael is dead. Well, he knew he was going to die before long. He'd practically told me. It seems as though he lasted longer than the doctors thought. Well, he was a strong man and an obstinate one. And a very rich one. Ha, ha, ha. Well, this won't get the knitting done, will it? Mr. Raphael. Not a man easy to forget, really. I can conjure up his appearance mentally quite well. A very definite personality, a difficult man, an irritable man, shockingly rude sometimes, which of course nobody resented because he had so much money. Yes, very rich. He had the secretary and a valet attendant, a qualified masseur. He'd not been able to get on very well without help. And a rather doubtful nurse attendant. Mr. Raphael had been very rude to him, too, sometimes. But again, of course, he didn't mind. What was it Mr. Raphael said? Nobody else would pay him half what I do, and he knows it. He's good at his job, though. Well, quite, Mr. Raphael. I was just wondering, is it necessary to be quite so rude? Considering what I pay him, Miss Marple, is it necessary to be quite so polite? I wonder what happened to him, Jackson, I mean. Oh, no, it was Johnson, yes. I wonder if he stayed on with Mr. Raphael. Perhaps a year, three or four months. Mm. Mr. Raphael was a man who liked change, though. He got tired of people, tired of their ways, tired of their faces, tired of their voices. I understand that. I felt the same sometimes. That last companion of mine, a nice, attentive woman, but she was so maddening, with her cooing voice. Now I've forgotten her name. Miss... Miss Bishop? No, not Bishop. Oh, dear, how difficult it is. And it wasn't Johnson. It was Jackson. Oh, never get old. I always get names wrong. Miss Knight, of course, not Bishop. Why did I think of Miss Bishop? Oh, Chess. Yes, Chess. A knight, a bishop. I shall be calling her Miss Castle next time, or Miss Rook. Though, really, she was not the sort of person who would ever rook anybody. No, indeed. Now, what was the name of that nice secretary Mr. Raphael had? Oh, yes, Esther Walters, that was right. I wonder what happened to her. She'd inherited money. She'd probably inherit money now. Mr. Raphael told me something about that. Hmm. No flowers. Yes, well, he could afford to buy up all the nurseries in England if he'd wanted. Anyway, I should not send flowers. We had not been on those terms. We'd not been friends, really, or on terms of affection. We'd been... Allies, yes, allies for a short time. A very exciting time, and he was an ally worth having. Yes, that night in the Caribbean when I came across him. I was wearing that pink wool, what did they call him when I was young? Fascinator, that's right. Nice pink sort of shawl scarf that was round my head. He'd looked at me and laughed. And later, when I explained everything that had been happening, well, he stopped laughing, and he did what I asked him. I hope he didn't suffer. I expect he was kept under sedatives by expensive doctors, easing the end. He suffered a great deal in the Caribbean. He'd nearly always been in pain. He was a brave man, yes. I'm sorry he's dead, because he was elderly and invalid and ill. The world has lost something. I wonder what he was like in business. Ruthless, I should think. Rude, overmastering and aggressive. A great attacker. But a good friend. And somewhere, deep inside, there was a kindness, not that he would show it. A man I could admire and respect. I wonder if he had any family. He never mentioned children. Had he been lonely? Or had he been too busy to be lonely? Too strange, as I thought about him. In some queer way, at that moment, I felt as though we were in touch. As if he'd approached me and suggested that we meet again. A bond, perhaps, in life that had been salvaged now in death. A bond. Oh, but surely we are very different types of people. I'm not ruthless, surely. But 
I believe I could be ruthless. Later that evening I was walking in the garden. I do admit to a rising irritation as I looked upon the snapdragons. I had told old George time and again that I only wanted sulphur-coloured antirhinums, not that rather ugly purple shade that gardeners always seem so fond of. Sulphur yellow, I said aloud. I beg your pardon. Did you say something? Oh, I was talking to myself, I'm afraid. A woman I did not know was leaning over the railing. It's a very nice garden. Well, it's not so nice now, when I could attend to it myself. Oh, I know just how you feel. I suppose you've got one of those what's-the-names for them, elderly chaps, you know, say they know all about gardening. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They come and have a lot of cups of tea and do a little weeding. They're very nice, but they're not gardeners. I'm a keen gardener myself. Do you live here? I'm boarding with a Mrs. Hastings. I think I've heard her speak of you. You're Miss Marple, aren't you? Oh, yes. I'm a sort of companion come gardener. My name's Bartlett, Miss Bartlett. There's not much to do there. She goes in for annuals. Do you know if you wouldn't mind? I could come here and do a few odd jobs now and again, a bit of tidying up. Something to get my teeth into, you see. <laughs> I dare say I'd be better than any chap you've got now. Well, that would be easy. I like flowers best. I don't care so much for vegetables. I do vegetables for Mrs. Hastings. Dull, but necessary. Well, good. I'll be getting along. She looked me up from head to foot, as though memorising me, then nodded cheerfully and tramped off. I must say, I was quite encouraged. But Mrs. Hastings... I couldn't remember any Mrs. Hastings. Oh, then, of course, there are those new houses at the end of Gibraltar Road. Several families moved in the last year. Yes, it could well be one of those. Ah, Mr. Raphael, what was the title of that book they used to quote when I was young? Ships that pass in the night. That was rather apt. Ships that pass in the night. It was not anger, I felt. It was insistence on something which was absolutely imperative to be put in hand at once. Indeed, I understood that. That ship that passed in the night had been an interesting ship. Once you got used to his being rude, he might have been an agreeable man. No, <laughs> Mr. Raphael would never have been an agreeable man. I must put him out of my head. Ships that pass in the night and speak each other in passing, only a signal shown and a distant voice in the darkness. I shall probably never think of him again. I will look to see if there is an obituary in the Times. I do not think it likely. He was not well known, not famous, He'd just been very rich. Of course, many people do have obituaries in the paper because they are very rich, but Mr. Raphael's richness, I think, would possibly not be of that kind. He would not have been prominent in any great industry. He had not been a financial genius or a noteworthy banker. He had just, all his life, made enormous amounts of money. It was about a week or so after Mr. Raphael's death that Miss Marple picked up a letter from her breakfast tray and looked at it for a moment before opening it. The other two letters that had come by the morning's post were bills, or possibly receipts for bills. In either case, they were not of any particular interest. This letter might be. A London postmark, typewritten address, a long, good-quality envelope. Miss Marple slit it neatly with a paper knife she always kept handy on her tray. It was headed, Messrs. Broadrib and Schuster, Solicitors and Notaries Public, with an address in Bloomsbury. It asked her, in suitable, courteous and legal phraseology, to call upon them one day in the following week at their office to discuss a proposition that might be to her advantage. Thursday the 24th was suggested. If that date was not convenient, perhaps she would let them know what date she would be likely to be in London in the near future. They added that they were the solicitors to the late Mr. Raphael, with whom they understood she had been acquainted. Miss Marple frowned in some slight puzzlement. She got up rather more slowly than usual, thinking about the letter she had received. She was escorted downstairs by Cherry, her companion, who was meticulous in hanging about in the hall so as to make sure that Miss Marple did not come to grief walking by herself down the staircase, which was of the old-fashioned kind, which turned a sharp corner in the middle of its run. "'You do take very good care of me, Cherry,' 
Got to. Good people are scarce. Well, thank you for the compliment. Miss Marple arrived safely with her last foot on the ground floor. Nothing the matter, is there? You look a bit rattled-like, if you know what I mean. No, there's nothing the matter, Jerry. I had rather an unusual letter, that's all, from a firm of solicitors. Oh, nobody's suing you for anything, are they? Cherry was inclined to regard solicitors' letters as invariably associated with disaster of some kind. Oh, no, I don't think so. Nothing of that kind. They just asked me to call upon them next week in London. Oh, perhaps you've been left a fortune. Well, that is very unlikely. Well, you never know. Setting herself in her chair and taking her knitting out of its embroidered knitting bag, Miss Marple considered the possibility of Mr. Raphael having left her a fortune. It seemed even more unlikely than when Cherry had suggested it. Mr. Raphael, she thought, was not that kind of man. It was not possible for her to go on the date suggested. She was attending a meeting of the Women's Institute to discuss the raising of a sum for building a small additional couple of rooms. But she wrote, naming a day in the following week. And in due course, her letter was answered, and the appointment definitely confirmed. She wondered what Messrs. Broadrib and Schuster were like. The letter had been signed by J. R. Broadrib, who was apparently the senior partner. It was possible, Miss Marple thought, that Mr. Raphael might have left her some small memoir or souvenir in his will. Perhaps some book on rare flowers that had been in his library, and which he thought would please an old lady who was keen on gardening. Or perhaps a cameo brooch which belonged to some great aunt of his. She amused herself by these fancies. They were only fancies, she thought, because in either case it would merely be a case of the executors, if these lawyers were the executors, forwarding her by post any such object. They would not have wanted an interview. Oh, well... I shall know next Tuesday. I wonder what she will be like, Mr. Schuster. Well, she's due in a quarter of an hour, Mr. Broadrib. I wonder if she would be the punctual type. Oh, I should think so. She's elderly, I gather, much more punctilious than the young scatterbrains of today. Fat or thin, I wonder, Mr. Broadrib. I do not know. Didn't Raphael ever describe her to you? He was extraordinarily cagey in everything he said about her. The whole business seems very odd to me. If we only knew a bit more about what it all meant. It might be... It might be something to do with Michael. What? After all these years? It couldn't be. What put that idea into your head? Did he mention? No, he didn't mention anything, Mr. Schuster. Gave me no clue at all as to what was in his mind. Just my instructions. I think he was getting a bit eccentric towards the end. Very you are wrong, not in the least. Mentally he was as brilliant as ever. His physical ill health never affected his brain. In the last two months of his life he made an extra two hundred thousand pounds. Just like that. Ah, uh, he had flair. Certainly he always had flair. A great financial brain. Not many like him. Bores for pity. Ah, yes, Miss Eiselthorpe. A Miss Jane Marple, sir. Show her up, please. Now we shall see. Miss Marple entered a room where a middle-aged gentleman with a thin, spare body and a long, rather melancholy face rose to greet her. This, apparently, was Mr. Broadrib, whose appearance somewhat contradicted his name. With him was another middle-aged gentleman of definitely more ample proportions. He had black hair, small keen eyes, and a tendency to a double chin. This is my partner, Mr. Schuster. I hope you didn't feel the stairs too much. Seventy if she's a day, thought Mr. Schuster. Nearer eighty, perhaps. Well, I do get a little breathless going upstairs. Yeah, it's an old-fashioned building, this, Miss Marple. No lift. As a very long-established firm, we don't go in for as many of the modern gadgets as perhaps some of our clients expect of us. Well, this room certainly has very pleasant proportions. Do sit down, thank you. If you will excuse me, I will allow you to communicate in private. Now then, I do hope that chair is comfortable. I'll pull the curtain slightly, shall I? 
You may feel the sun a little too much in your eyes. Thank you. Miss Marple sat upright, as was her habit. She wore a light tweed suit, a string of pearls, and a small velvet toque. To himself, Mr. Broadrib was saying, The provincial lady, a good type. Yes, fluffy old girl. May be scatty, may not. Quite a shrewd eye. I wonder where Raphael came across her. Somebody's aunt, perhaps, up from the country. Well, we shall see. As these thoughts passed to his head, he was making the sort of introductory small talk relating to the weather and the unfortunate effects of late frosts early in the year and such other remarks as would be considered suitable. Miss Marple made the necessary responses and sat placidly awaiting the opening of preliminaries to the meeting. You will be wondering what all this is about. Uh, now let me see. You have heard no doubt of Mr. Raphael's death. Perhaps you saw it in the paper? I did see it in the paper, and I understand he was a friend of yours. I met him just over a year ago, in the West Indies. Ah, ah, yes, I remember he went out there, for his health, I believe. It did him some good, perhaps, for he was a very ill man, badly crippled, as you know. Yes. You knew him well? No, I would not say that. We were fellow visitors in a hotel. We had occasional conversations, but I never saw him again after my return to England. I lived very quietly in the country, you see. I gather he was completely absorbed in business. He continued transacting business right up... Well... I could almost say right up to the day of his death. A very fine financial brain. I'm sure that was so. I realised quite soon that he was, well, a very remarkable character altogether. I don't know if you have any idea whether you were given any idea at some time by Mr. Raphael as to what this proposition is that I've been instructed to put to you. I cannot imagine what possible kind of proposition Mr. Raphael might have wanted to put up to me. It seems most unlikely. He had a very high opinion of you. Well, that is kind of him, but hardly justified. I am a very simple person. As you no doubt realise, he died a very rich man. The provisions of his will are on the whole fairly simple. He had already made dispositions on his fortune some time before his death, trusts and other beneficial arrangements. Well, that is, I believe, very usual procedure nowadays, though I am not at all cognizant of financial matters myself. The purpose of this appointment is that I am instructed to tell you that a sum of money has been laid aside to become yours absolutely at the end of one year, but conditional on your accepting a certain proposition with which I am to make you acquainted. He took from the table in front of him a long envelope. It was sealed. He passed it across the table to her. It would be better, I think, that you should read it for yourself. There is no hurry. Please take your time. Miss Marple took her time. She availed herself of a small paper knife, which Mr. Broadrip handed to her, slit up the envelope, took out the enclosure, one sheet of typewriting, and read it. She folded it up again, then reread it, and looked at Mr. Broadrib. This is hardly very definite. Is there no more definite elucidation of any kind? Not as far as I am concerned. I was to hand you this, and tell you the amount of the legacy. The sum in question is twenty thousand pounds, free of legacy duty. Miss Marple sat looking at him. Surprise had rendered her speechless. Mr. Broadrib said no more for a moment. He was watching her closely. There was no doubt of her surprise. It was obviously the last thing Miss Marple had expected to hear. Mr. Broadrib wondered what her first words would be. She looked at him with the directness, the severity that one of his own aunts might have done, and when she spoke it was almost accusingly. That is a very large sum of money. Not quite so large as it used to be. He just stopped himself, saying, mere chicken feed nowadays. I must admit... But I am amazed, frankly, quite amazed. She picked up a document and read it carefully through again. I gather you know the terms of this? Yes, it was dictated to me personally by Mr. Raphael. D. 
Did he not give you any more explanation? No, he did not. You suggested, I suppose, that it might be better if he did. Uh, you are quite right. That is what I did. I said that you might find it difficult to, to understand what he was driving at. Very remarkable. Uh, there is no need, of course, for you to give me an answer now. No. I should have to reflect upon this. It is, as you have pointed out, quite a substantial sum of money. I am old. Elderly, we say, but old is a better word. Definitely old. It is both possible and indeed probable that I might not live as long as a year to earn this money, in the rather doubtful case that I was able to earn it. Money is not to be despised at any age. I could benefit certain charities in which I have an interest. "'And there are always people, people whom one wishes one could do a little something for, "'but one's own funds do not admit of it. "'And then I will not pretend that there are not pleasures and desires, "'things that one has not been able to indulge in or to afford. "'I think Mr. Raphael knew quite well that to be able to do so, "'quite unexpectedly, would give an elderly person a great deal of pleasure. "'Yes, indeed.' A cruise abroad, perhaps. One of these excellent tours is arranged nowadays. Theatres, concerts, the ability to replenish one's cellars. My tastes would be a little more moderate than that. Partridges. It's very difficult to get partridges nowadays. They're so expensive. I should enjoy a partridge. A whole partridge to myself. Very much. A box of marron glacé. It's an expensive taste which I cannot often gratify. Possibly a visit to the opera. It means a car to take one to Covent Garden and back, and the expense of a night in a hotel. But I must not indulge in idle chat. I will take this back with me and reflect upon it. Really, what on earth made Mr. Raphael? You do have no idea why he suggested this particular proposition, and why he should think that I could be of service to him in any way? "'He must have known that it was over a year, nearly two years, since he'd last seen me. "'I might have got much more feeble than I have, "'and much more unable to exercise such small talents as I might have. "'He was taking a risk. "'There are other people surely much better qualified "'to undertake an investigation of this nature.' "'Frankly, one would think so. "'But he selected you, Miss Marple. "'Forgive me if this is idle curiosity, but have you had... How shall I put it? Any connection with crime or the investigation of crime? Strictly speaking, I should say no. Nothing professional. I have never been a probation officer, or indeed sat as a magistrate on the bench, or been connected in any way with a detective agency. To explain to you, Mr. Broadrib, which I think is only fair for me to do, and which I think Mr. Raphael ought to have done, to explain it in any way, all I can say is that during our stay in the West Indies, we both, Mr. Raphael and myself, had a certain connection with a crime that took place there, a rather unlikely and perplexing murder. And you and Mr. Raphael solved it. I would not put it quite like that. But Mr. Raphael, by the force of his personality, and I, by putting together one or two obvious indications that came to my notice, were successful in preventing a second murder, just as it was about to take place. I could not have done it alone, I was physically far too feeble. Mr. Raphael could not have done it alone. He was a cripple. We acted as allies, however. Just one question I should like to ask you, Miss Marple. Does the word nemesis mean anything to you? A very slow and unexpected smile dawned on Miss Marple's face. Yes, it does mean something to me. It meant something to me, and it meant something to Mr. Raphael. I said it to him, and he was much amused by my describing myself by that name. Whatever Mr. Broadrip had expected, it was not that. He looked at Miss Marple with something of the same astonished surprise that Mr. Raphael had once felt in a bedroom by the Caribbean Sea. A nice and quite intelligent old lady, but really nemesis? You feel the same, I'm sure. She rose to her feet. If you should find or receive any further instructions in the matter, you would perhaps let me know, Mr. Broadrib. 
It seems to me extraordinary that there should not be something of that kind. This leaves me entirely in the dark, really, as to what Mr. Raphael is asking me to do, or try to do. You are not acquainted with his family, his friends, his... No, I told you, he was a fellow traveller in a foreign part of the world. We had a certain association as allies in a very mystifying matter, and that is all. He had a secretary, Mrs. Esther Walters. Would it be infringing etiquette if I asked if Mr. Raphael left her fifty thousand pounds? Well, his bequest will appear in the press. I can answer your question in the affirmative. Mrs. Walters' name is now Mrs. Anderson, by the way. She remarried. I am glad to hear that. She was a widow with one daughter, and she was a very adequate secretary, it appears. She understood Mr. Raphael very well. A nice woman. I am glad she has benefited. That evening, Miss Marple, sitting in her straight-backed chair, her feet stretched out to the fireplace, where a small wood fire was burning owing to the sudden cold spell, which, as is its habit, can always descend on England at any moment selected by itself, took once more from the long envelope the document delivered to her that morning. Still in a state of partial unbelief, she read, murmuring the words here and there below her breath, as though to impress them on her mind. To Miss Jane Marple, resident in the village of St. Mary Mead. This will be delivered to you after my death by the good offices of my solicitor, James Broadrip. He is the man I employ for dealing with such legal matters as fall in the field of my private affairs, not my business activities. He is a sound and trustworthy lawyer. Like the majority of the human race, he is susceptible to the sin of curiosity. I have not satisfied his curiosity. In some respects, this matter will remain between you and myself. Our code word, my dear lady, is nemesis. I don't think you will have forgotten in what place and in what circumstances you first spoke that word to me. In the course of my business activities over what is now quite a long life. I have learned one thing about a man whom I wish to employ. He has to have a flair, a flair for the particular job I want him to do. It is not knowledge, it is not experience. The only word that describes it is flair, a natural gift for doing a certain thing. You, my dear, if I may call you that, have a natural flair for justice, and that has led to you having a natural flair for crime. I want you to investigate a certain crime. I've ordered a certain sum to be placed, so that if you accept this request, and as a result of your investigation this crime is properly elucidated, the money will become yours absolutely. I have set aside a year for you to engage on this mission. You are not young, but you are, if I may say so, tough. I think I can trust a reasonable fate to keep you alive for a year at least. I think the work involved will not be distasteful to you. You have a natural genius, I should say, for investigation. The necessary funds for what I may describe as working capital for making this investigation will be remitted to you during that period whenever necessary. I offer this to you as an alternative to what may be your life at present. I envisage you sitting in a chair, a chair that is agreeable and comfortable for whatever kind or form of rheumatism from which you may suffer, all persons of your age, I consider, are likely to suffer from some form of rheumatism. If this ailment affects your knees or your back, it will not be easy for you to get about much, and you will spend your time mainly in knitting. I see you as I saw you once, one night, as I rose from sleep disturbed by your urgency, in a cloud of pink wool. <laughs> I envisage you knitting more jackets and headscarves and a good many other things of which I don't even know the name. And if you prefer to continue knitting, that is your decision. But if you prefer to serve the cause of justice, I hope that you may at least find it interesting. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like 
thick and everlasting stream. Miss Marple refolded the sheet of paper and replaced it in the envelope. 